Welcome to week 4 of our Open SAP course, Build Mobile Applications with SAP Cloud Platform Mobile Services. In the previous week, I focus on micro apps. In this week, I will talk about the cross-platform native app development. Now, let's start with an introduction to the Mobile Development Kit. The challenge when building applications for multiple platforms at the same time is that it often results in bad user experience on both sides. On the other hand, it can be very expensive to build native applications for each platform. So we need a solution to solve this. And the solution we came up with is the Mobile Development Kit. The Mobile Development Kit is a cross-platform write once approach. So you write your application once and it runs natively on iOS and Android. This makes sure that you get a native user experience that is fast and reliable. At the same time, we try to bring in an approach that is as easy to maintain as possible. So we lowered the development part and created a low code environment. At the same time, it, the apps that come out of the mobile development kit should provide full offline functionality as well as notifications and other native features. One requirement in enterprise software is that you often need to cope with changes. So the business or the users demand changes in your mobile application frequently. In order to avoid the full life cycle or going through full the, li the full life cycle of an application with develop deployment signing the code app and distribution of the app, we tried to improve the life cycle with the mobile development kit to make it easy for you to roll out changes to the field. And of course, the mobile development kit applications are extensible via extension support. Mobile development kit contains three parts. The editor, this is where you build your mobile development kit based application. You have two options here. One is the plugin we already know in the, within the web IDE and the other is an extension to the Visual Studio Code editor that you can install on your local developer machine. The second part is the runtime. This is where the mobile development kit applications will be distributed from as well where the client on the device will connect to, as usual. Here you have the features that you already know, like log upload, offline synchronization, and the like. On the client, for each application, there's a mobile development kit client. It's somehow the shell of the application that runs and executes the app that you built with the mobile development kit and what the user is actually using on the device. There are clients for Android and iOS but they are using the same application and executing the same application at runtime. The architecture is very similar to what we have seen in mobile cards. We have the backend system, we do have mobile services, we have the edit the design time in the web IDE. What comes here on top is that we need the so-called app update feature of the mobile services to store the actual application data and then distribute it to the clients on the devices. There are even more benefits of the mobile development kit. First of all, it can also run complex business lo logic locally on the device. That means if you are in offline mode and want to execute local business object, you have a way doing so. The user will not get an HTML view that is rendered on a device like in a browser, which is usually used for cross-platform applications. But here, the buttons and labels and everything, everything that you see on the screen are actual native device, uh, not device, but UI controls. The application can run in online and offline mode. The applications in the mobile development kit are based on the native SDKs that we will discuss in week five. But 
They feature the same look and feel than the native applications using the SAP Fiori look and feel um, that we see here on the screen as well. The extensibility of the mobile development kit allows you to include specific application features that have not been prepared by SAP. And obviously in an enterprise environment, the applications can be customized to adjust, to be adjusted to the uh, various language requirements. Let's talk a little bit more about the extendability. The mobile development kit client that runs on the, on, on the uh, device as an application can be extended. So if your player, the client, needs to have a specific feature, you can add your own feature to the client, similar to uh, what the Apache Cordova framework, for instance, does with its plugins. Here, you write the extensions either in Swift for iOS or in NativeScript for Android and iOS at the same time. NativeScript is an open source platform for cross-platform app development and the mobile development kit sits on top of it. The extension control that is basically a kind of a wrapper in the editor will then reference the Swift classes and make sure that even in the web, edit, web IDE you can access the extension. In addition, the extensions can also access the actions, rules and locali localized text from the app. But what, what this means in detail, we will explain later. On the client's side, which means the app on the device, needs to be built. Here we have two options. First, you can just download the generic player or the generic client from the App Store, from Apple or from Google Play. This is the generic SAP branded client that we usually use during development. With Mobile Development Kit, it's the case that for each application you build, you need your client. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. So latest at, the, at your second application, you need to build your own client. And this can be done with our Mobile Development Kit SDK. The Mobile Development Kit SDK holds all the tools that you need to build a client and adjust it to your needs. So you can even brand it or add the extensions to it. The SDK runs on Mac or Windows and it's running locally. So it's not a cloud tool in this case. But there's also an option to build the client in the cloud using our cloud build service. Here we do the compilation of the client and prepare everything for you. So you just need to download your client from the mobile services cockpit. We have a little bit more. So we already mentioned that we, you can localize your applications so that you can have it in multiple languages at the same time. Also, MDK supports for push notifications. You can receive push notifications to trigger actions in your applications. You can take advantage of the inbuilt camera and use the barcode scanning features of the camera as well. In Mobile Development Kit, you can build reusable app artifacts that you can share across applications. So you have like a, maybe a screen for presenting the information of a business partner and you can reuse that screen in multiple applications at the same time. We already have discussed in uh, the first week when to use the mobile development kit and what it's good for. But I want to recap that here. So for once, the mobile development kit is running natively on the device, so it provides a native look and feel cross-platform. Due to the visual development approach, it's very easy and fast to develop the applications. That also 
comes w along with the simplified app development lifecycle. So once you have a change, you can easily roll out it to all the users in a couple of clicks. And the mobile development kit restricts the amount of flexibility you have in the UI, making it very easy to have a consistent UI across multiple applications. So at the end, all your application will look similar and will behave similar, which makes it easier for users to adapt and use your application. Mobile Development Kit is not the sol one-shot solution for all your use cases, but it's very good for applications where the user needs to use the application for a longer period of time, maybe a couple of hours per, per day. It is also good for complex applications and obviously for offline applications. An example here would be field service applications or asset management apps. The required skill set is uh, JavaScript, a little bit of style sheet, and the mobile development kit itself. And that's why you're here, and that's what this week is all about. By the way, there's one SAP application that we have uh, in the market. It's the SAP Asset Manager. The SAP Asset Manager is a work order management application for, with complete offline and also online features um, for mobile asset management. It provides, it leverages the features of the mobile development kit with the uh, improved lifecycle, with the offline and push notification, and it sits on top of S4 HANA and so forth. So, how does it look like? What we will do here is I will show you the client uh, on the device and browse through the demo mode. The demo mode feature is something that you can also put into your client so that the user of your application can play around with some sample data before actually connecting to mobile services and starting the app for real. When I open the mobile services application, this is the client that we have in the App Store, you can click on the Try the Demo link to start the demo application. As you can see in the upper right corner, left-hand corner, you'll see that I'm in the flight mode. But even here, the application is fully working. So I have the object header here, I see my customers, I can see the promotions, and the catalog preview. If I click, for instance, on the Gaming Monster Pro, I can even edit the details and change it to tell that it's using Windows 10. Just saving it, the product has been updated, and I can just work like in any other application. You also see that the views are very nicely aligned, and all this has been done with the mobile development kit. Well, you can also opt out of the application and close the demo mode via the user page and just say reset all and you are back on the front. So in this unit, we have discussed the benefits of the mobile development kit. We have seen that there are three basic components, the editor, the runtime, and the client. We have discussed all the features, when to use, and we even looked at a real-world example of an application that you can buy from SAP um, to, if you have the need for. This concludes the first unit of week four. In the next unit, we will dive into developing with the mobile development kit. Thanks for listening and hope to see you there. Welcome to week four, unit two. In the previous unit, I provided an introduction to the mobile development kit. In this unit, I will show you how to develop with the MDK. Let's get started. There are two ways to create mobile development kits. One is to use the mobile service app development tools 
in the SAP Web IDE full stack version. Here you have a layout designer, but no debugging capabilities. But it's still a very nice low coding environment. The other option is to use Microsoft Visual Studio Code. Here we provide a plugin to Visual Studio Code that lets you develop mobile development kit applications as well as debug the application on your device. On the other hand, it does not provide a layout designer because Visual Studio Code is just, just a text editor. But it's a good environment for the actual developer who knows how JavaScript works and who knows how debugging works. The overall process from a top view is that before you actually start creating an MDK application, you would create the mobile services app configuration in the mobile services cockpit. Here you assign all the features that the MDK needs, configure the backend connectivity, the security and so forth. Then you would switch to the web IDE and create a project based on one of the templates that we provide. Then you would start actual development of the mobile development kit application. You would add new screens, add transitions from one screen to another, grab data from the back end, modify it and so forth. At the end you would deploy the developed application to mobile services with the deployment function of the mobile services tools within the web IDE. The project templates we provide for building MDK-based applications are um, listed here. So we have a template that is a real empty template that really just contains the minimal amount of data that you need to create an application from scratch. We have a base application that at least connects to your backend. The list detail application template that we provide is already reading data from the backend and provides you the first screens already. Then we do have a template for full CRUD application. So create, read, update and delete. Using that you have a full offline application already generated for you that you can start with and develop on top of it. All templates do support online and offline and as well as other features. The template basically will create a project structure for you, but it will also add the metadata. Metadata is the term that we need or that we're using to explain that the MDK is actually based on metadata and the metadata here describes how the app should look like, what kind of controls are arranged in what sequence, what the actions are and what features you are uh, using in your application. Our metadata is based on the JSON format. So it's human readable, it's clearly structured and you can even edit it directly in the code editor. The metadata describes how a view look like but also how the behavior of the application is. So for instance you would here see that the behavior of the toolbar control should be on press, on the event on press execute this action. So here you connect an action with the, user ex with the user interface. The metadata will then be taken to mobile services where it's distributed to the clients. The client will then read the metadata at runtime and exactly read here that he needs to open up a page because this is a page and the caption of the page is the term main or the string main and there's an area of control. Controls which are, should be displayed on the screen. So it's pretty straightforward. And if you remember then it's actually the same concept that you have in a browser with HTML. HTML would be the metadata and the browser is executing the metadata so that you see the web page. We are following the same concepts but we are not using web technologies, HTML and the browser technology in the mobile development kit. The outcome of the metadata at runtime 
is that the browser, uh, that the client will not show a rendered HTML5 or HTML button, but here in the metadata case, it will actually render a button which comes from the native underlying SDK. And the metadata already covers the usual behavior of an application, like let's say 80% of the standard application of, an, uh, of a typical application. So opening a page, closing a page, opening an alert window, validation, um, what, whatever you typically see in an application can be declaratively used within the metadata. So you don't need to code it. This is where the low code comes into play. So again, the key takeaway here is that's not HTML, but we still use a description language. Let's have a quick look at the project structure. Once you create an MDK project, you see various folders. And this is just a real simple folder. And in these folders, you find little metadata, let's say artifacts. These artifacts are single files in JSON format with different endings, and they are orga always organized like this. So in the action folder, you should put all the actions that you are using in your applications. Globals, there you can put in global variables that are read only. I18N is for the localization files. Images contain static files, and the objects contain your data uh, proxy structure. The pages contains the actual view, so which screen and another screen that you see in your application. Rules is a little bit special. Here you have, let's say, JavaScript artifacts where you can implement your local business logic. Styles is a CSS-like view to change the uh, view and outlook of your iOS uh, or Android controls on the screen. The application.app file is the main entry point of your application. Here you can define the starting parameters of your application. The web IDE, and in particular the MDK editor in the web IDE, consists of two things to change the metadata. Actually three, if we don't count the code editor as well. So the wizard is whenever you create a new artifact, like a new rule or a new action, then a wizard pops up and asks you and guides you through the creation of the metadata. If you change an existing artifact, like a rule or an MDK action, then you see like this an open MD an MDK action editor, for instance. Here all the properties that can appear in, in the metadata will be listed. So you don't need to remember what properties do I, can, do I need to, uh, which properties can I put into an action. Here the action properties are listed and you just need to provide the values. And there are several other, let's say, editors that helps you to create an MDK application. Very important is the page editor. It comes with a layout editor that lets you preview how the screen will be rendered later on. It's not meant and not designed to be a what you see is what you get editor. I typically refer to it to as you what you see is what you might expect editor. Nevertheless, here you would also define the data binding. So you would say in this label this data should be appear. Um, you would also add actions to events so that you can basically move, for instance, from one page to another. Here on that screen, you also see the example that there's a lockout button, which needs a lockout uh, action and so forth. We also have an outline view here so that you see the hierarchy of the UI controls in your page. Another support for the developer here is the so-called object browser. Whenever you want to reference a piece, of the MDK metadata or data, then you can use the object browser to easily navigate to that. It's often used, for instance, in the um, data mapping. 
So if you want to assign a data coming from the backend to a label or a field, then you can easily use the object browser to browse through the available data from the backend and assign it to the field. The object browser can also be used for other purposes. So here you can reference globals or actions and so forth. When you create local business logic, right, then you also have two options here. The so-called rule editor lets you develop local business rules with a graphical editor. Here you can drag and drop structural ingredients for your rule, for your JavaScript rule, and in the background it will generate a JavaScript for you. The other way around is not possible. So if you write the JavaScript directly, it will not, not uh, be rendered into this nice looking kind of visual representation of your code. And, uh, but you are free to choose whatever fits best to your skills. If you are more um, familiar with ja providing JavaScript directly, then stick to it. It's up to you. The rule editor is basically targeting the, uh, the citizen developer role of the MDK developers, um, while the JavaScript editor direct or editing the JavaScript directly is more for the advanced developer. If you want to debug it or are very fam familiar with the MDK metadata, you can use the Visual Studio Code extension to develop locally. Many developers prefer to run development um, IDEs locally. So uh, this is one reason why we offer this. The other is that on a local machine, you can directly connect your device and start debugging on the device. This is very helpful if, uh, there is, if you want to learn more about the details and the behavior. And with the Studio Code extension here, you can do that easily. One feature that the extension provides is that the editor, the code editor, is aware of the valid metadata. So it has full code, code completion and validation inbuilt. So let's do the hand on. We will create the app configuration in mobile services first before we start actually creating the MDK application in the web IDE. Then we will deploy the web IDE application that we, that we built there into mobile services, start the client, and consume it from there. So in mobile services, as usual, I need to refresh my session. And in my account here, I don't have any application configured except the SAP mobile cards, which already comes pre-configured. But everything else here is empty. So what we will do now is create a, our first application. Give it a name. And we call our application Chef's Delight. Because you remember the use case, our chef Steve should input the menu into the system using our MDK application. So saving that application and what we get is already assigned a specific feature. It's the mobile settings exchange. This is the mandatory feature that each and every application needs to have. If we look at the security tab, we see that we got an OAuth application configuration um, up front. That means our application will be authenticated using OAuth. What we do now is we will add some features that are needed by the mobile development kit. First of all, the mobile connectivity feature. This provides access to the backend system. Secondly, back. Secondly, we will add the offline feature because we want to create an offline application. Steve is often on the go in, in the kitchen, you know, and needs to add the menu. 
we know that during the operation and runtime of the application things can happen so we need the mobile client log upload there as well. The lifecycle of MDK applications are managed using the app update feature. So we add that as well. App update. From a feature perspective, that should be enough for the moment. We can later add features when we have the need for. What we need to define next is where our data comes from. So here I need to add the mobile configuration, our canteen service. The easiest way in our case, because we are using it in the mobile cards, is to copy it from the configuration from mobile cards. So here I go back to mobile cards, connect on connectivity, and I just copy, let's go here, I just copy that URL, close this, go back to my Chef's Delight, connectivity, and create a new destination. The destination name is very important and the first destination defaults to the name of the application, but we can give it any name. We keep it here with the defaults. A destination defines all the properties that are important to connect to the backend system. We have, can add custom headers here if the backend is expecting those. We can add annotations. Uh, we can, this is very important, define what security for the backend is being needed. Uh, here the no authentic we take the no authentication option because our service is publicly available. Um, by the way this is not a good recommendation for production. So anyhow we use no authentication here during development. We don't have any specific key and trust stores for the HTTPS configuration and that's it already. So we can, if we sum, uh, do a summary, we edit the features, we define the connectivity, and we double check that we have the OAuth configuration for securing the user. Now we can go to the web IDE and create a new project from scratch. New project from template category mobile services and here we find our mobile cards micro app if we want to create a card from here we can use just create a blank card from here and then deploy it later on to mobile services we have the mobile or data service project here that we already discussed and here are the four templates for the mobile development kit the base application the empty the list detail and the CRUD application the wizard here, Chef's Delight, will directly talk to mobile services and to the backend in order to get the data and receive the metadata of the backend service. So here, we tell our template project wizard which destination it should connect to. First of all, to which mobile services instance it should connect. In this case, it's mobile services underscore CF for Cloud Foundry. Then it connects to my Cloud Foundry instance and asks to which application. And we have two, right? One for the mobile cards. Uh, but this is com.sap.open.mobile and then each application can have multiple destinations. We just have one and it defaults to the name of the application ID so it's pretty simple. We need to give our local service a name and we call it canteen service. 
Here is the button that allows us to create an online or full offline application and you see that offline is the default, so we keep it. If I click the check button, the wizard here will connect to mobile services, retrieves the metadata and checks for consistency. We are lucky because successfully retrieved service metadata, we can go to the next step. Now, since the wizard does understand what is the data source, we can select from our menu set, from our canteen set, and what we want to see on the first page of our application is a list of canteens to which Steve wants to add a menu. So we choose the canteen set. These are titles, subhead descriptions, labels on our uh, list. And let's change the title to name and the subhead to ID and click next. Here we can customize our template and for instance just ask for the top five first uh, canteens so that the list is not too long. We can also add other page properties or change the list of the pages that will be generated. Let's stick to the defaults so far. Now we can add offline synchronization features. What we want to do here is we want to make sure that Steve can access all the data that he needs also in offline mode. But we don't need all of the data that the service provides. We just need to know which canteen he's working for and we want to know what the menu is. So we can add the menu set to the list but we will not add the bookings because Steve has nothing to do with the bookings. That's the information that the wizard needs to generate the project. So here's the project structure that we discussed already. And let me just open the main page. The layout editor starts and you see that we have a main page, a logout button and a sync button, whatever that means and we want to test this application now for the first time and see if it's running. So right click on the project gives me the option to deploy and activate. Deploying the project means I take all the metadata that I have in my project and put it to mobile services into the app update feature. Next. Here again I need to tell the web IDE where to deploy it to. If I select the microservices CF destination, it connects to my microservice, uh, sorry, to my mobile services on Cloud Foundry. And here I need to select the card or the mobile application, the MDK application. And obviously we need to choose the com.sap.open.mobile. Before I click next, I want to show you this little icon because here the web IDE gives me an onboarding code for the application. What I do now is I've already downloaded the, show it to you here, the mobile services application. And what I want to do now is I want to scan this code to onboard the mobile services client, the MDK client on the device. This connects it to my instance of mobile services. So here, let's start the scanner. Scan it. And this is the onboarding screen of the mobile services client. Now I click start and it connects to Cloud Foundry and asks for my credentials. Typing in the passcode. And if I'm not mistaken, it should log on now. 
and provide me the end user license agreement, which is part of the client. I agree to it and I need to choose the passcode because this is the default policy when I create a new app on mobile services. You can turn that on later on, on or off. Now I did a mistake. Let's start the client again. Enter my passcode. Oh no, I was right. I'm already onboarded now, but what I don't have, I don't have the metadata in the application. So the application client is empty at the moment. Once I click next, the web IDE will make sure that all the metadata is valid and in the right format, package it into a zip file and copies it to mobile services. Once it's there, we can see the revision in the mobile app update. Once it's there, I can restart the application on the device and at application start, it will download the application from mobile, the metadata from mobile services and execute it. So here you see that we have the current revision is now one. In mobile services, if I reload that page, I see the metadata here. I have the metadata uploaded by myself and if I open mobile services now and unlock the application. It will ask me to confirm the update, which I do. Download the data. Application service initialized and I have a complete offline application here. I can even edit the data and update the canteen. I won't do that now, but that's it. This concludes Unit 2, Developing with the Mobile Development Kit. Thanks a lot for listening. In the next unit, I will explain the metadata of the MDK. Hope to see you there. Welcome to week four, unit three. In the previous unit, we discussed the development flow of the mobile development kit. In this unit, I will explain the metadata of the MDK. Let's get started. Before we actually dive into the metadata, let's quickly discuss the client again. The MDK client executes the metadata that we provide using the mobile services. The client is available for iOS and Android. The client runs the metadata, the same metadata on each device platform and executes it there and provides the appropriate screens and user experience on the respective platform. It's important to understand that we don't use HTML rendering technology here, but instead the metadata will be executed and native UI controls will be rendered on the screen. This makes sure that the screen is um, responsive and the user experience is exactly what the user expects on the, on the platform. The client also contains a JavaScript engine that lets us execute the rules locally um, and you can build the rules in JavaScript so you can reuse your skill set there. Also, the client supports extensions. So you can provide extensions to the client and rebuild the client and recompile the client locally to make sure that it provides the feature set that you, are want, that you want to bring to the user. 
Also, it's important to understand that each client runs exactly one version of the metadata. So one application that you build in the web IDE needs its own client on the device. So at the end, on the home screen, you will have multiple clients for your multiple applications. The client also supports branding. That means you can change the home screen icon of your client, you can change um, the colors and build it for your corporate identity and you can definitely sign your client. So this is also important for supporting push notifications. The metadata is structured in a project. Each project contains multiple folders and the folders contain um, <laughs> metadata artifacts. So here on the right hand side we see the typical project structure of an MDK application. The folders help you to find and structure your metadata artifacts so that, for instance, all the actions are in the actions folder and all the pages are in the page folders. The default folder structure is actually not mandatory and you can, for instance, create subfolders for pages to further structure your project and make sure that you can navigate easily in your project. One important thing is the app application.app file. This one is the starting point of your application and here you define global behavior of the app itself. For instance, which rules and actions should be executed at the beginning of the application or if the application goes into the background state. The files, the metadata artifacts, have suffixes in the file names to make sure that you can easily distinguish between the the different file types. So action for instance is the file suffix dot action. For rules it's rule, page, dot page and global is dot global. I think that's pretty straightforward. Knowing the metadata itself is quite important for advanced tasks. You can create a fully working operational CRUD kind of application without even knowing the metadata, but it helps to further enhance the application and adjust it to your needs. Here on the right hand side you see a typical example of the metadata of the MDK. It's a JSON file, it has properties and values. The metadata can be created in many ways. One for instance is in the editor, that means um, by hand or using the uh, wizards uh, that we already discussed. We will change the metadata in the various editors, then we will distribute them to mobile services and at the end they will be executed in the client. Each metadata object has a name and a type. They are these properties are identified via underscore name and underscore type. It's a recommendation to provide meaningful names because you will reference your artifacts throughout your application. For instance, a page could be referenced by, will be referenced by its name, so it's important to give meaningful names here. Speaking of pages, so a page defines a view and there are actually two kinds of view that we distinguish in the MDK, the so-called section page and a form cell page. The section page is used for lists and other, let's say, showing um, lists of, of items that you want to show. While the form cell page is for data entry. So here you would provide links and uh, fields and values to change and edit or update or even create new objects. The section page is basically for all other pages. Each page, from a metadata point of view, contains uh, a an, an property called controls and this property is an array and the array contains a list of metadata object artifacts.
So here, for instance, we see a page with the array of controls on the right hand side and one UI type in that control array is the control type toolbar item. So we see that the toolbar item is called logout toolbar item and we see the other properties of this toolbar item. There are two ways to modify the metadata. One is the editors that we provide and the other is the code editor itself. You can decide uh, every time to switch between those two options so you can change the metadata directly in the code editor, it will be reflected in the editors and vice versa. Once you're done with changing your metadata, you need to instantiate or start the build process. The build process for the metadata is not comparable to the build process of compiling a native application. What we're doing during the build process is we will validate the whole metadata in your project for consistency and uh, syntax checks. Then we will make sure that all the metadata files will be merged into a so-called bundle.js and this bundle.js will then be deployed to mobile services. Mobile services itself provides the ability to copy the metadata into mobile services but not yet deploy to the devices. But you can also check this checkbox here so it will automatically de be deployed. Usually this is a two-step process. The developers de deploy to mobile services and the administrator activates the specific version. When we do a change to the metadata, we will provide you a migration process so that you just can migrate your current version of the metadata to a new version of the metadata. The metadata in the editor, for instance in the web IDE, can be exported. You may want to do that if you manually want to deploy the metadata to mobile services and not using the inbuilt function or you may want to use the export if you uh, want to further develop in the Visual Studio Code extensions for the MDK. Exporting here is uh, following two different rules. One is you will export the whole project and the individual artifacts to import them into Visual Studio. The other is that you just download the bundle.js file this is the deployment artifact that you would put manually to mobile services. We will do that in the demo later on. Oh, speaking of demo, here we go. So we will use the editor to change one of the, or two properties. Then I show you the validate and deployment process. We will manually deploy, create a bundle.js to manually deploy it. And then we will also do the export for Visual Studio Code. Here we are in our Web IDE extension with our Chef's Delight application. On the, right, uh, on the right here you see the page editor and I can, for instance, change the caption using the editor and the properties here. Let's say Chef's Delight. So you see that the changes in the caption were reflected in the layout editor. I can save that, but I can also right click on the main page and open the code editor for it. Here we also see the same property, Chef's Delight, and I can, for instance, say, change that to Welcome to Chef's Delight. Saving that and going back to the editor of the page shows you that the code changes will also be reflected in the editor. So there are two things to export, two ways to export it. For Visual Studio Code export for instance, I would just export the whole project. So right clicking on the project, clicking export, will download the whole zip file to my desktop. 
While if I want to create a bundle deployment, I need to right click and click on MDK deploy and activate. Before I do that, I can also manually validate. This will create a code check or start a code check. Here the metadata validation is completed. So I'm fully okay with starting the deployment process. To create the bundle.js file, I can check tick, <laughs> tick this checkbox download bundle to local machine, which after the bundle.js has been created, downloads, starts the download to my local machine. Uploading the bundle means I take the bundle.js and put it to mobile services. And depending on what I, if I need it for further debugging, I can also include the source map for the debugging. So in this case, I just want to download this, the bundle.js, and click Next. So <coughs> now you see that the task, the build has been started. And you will also mention that there will be a no new project in your workspace, which is the MDK Webpack Factory. This is a, let's say, temporary working directory where we take all the assets of your project and create this bundle.js file at the very end. This is a really a temporary project or let's say a folder. And depending on if it's up to date or not, it takes, it takes a time for the first time to be created. You see that here are some uh, node dependency being installed that's important for the build process. You can delete the Webpack factory anytime but then it will be uh, recreated uh, on the next build process. So I have downloaded the project already. So here I will extract it. And this folder I will now open in Visual Studio Code. In Visual Studio Code, I have already installed the extension called mobile. Mobile Development Kit, MDK 1.7. And just by clicking on Install, you will install the MDK extension into your Visual Studio Code. Let's close this and open the folder that I have just extracted. Chef's Delight. On the left hand side, I do see the same project st structure that we had in the web IDE. And I can see that I have a main page. And if I open it, we see the welcome to Chef's Delight application. See, there's a space, I can delete that. And what I can do here. I can, for instance, add a section by adding a new control. And you see that if I ty start typing, the Visual Studio suggests to add metadata properties because the MDK extension does understand the metadata. So I can choose the type. And then you see what kind of sections, type, and controls are available in that page. So it's aware of that you are currently in a section. So it just lists you the UI controls that you can add to a section. So let's take a button table just for the sake of the demo. And I said we always need a name and give it a name, my button table. Then I store that. And when I do store this, this will automatically create a bundle.js file um, whenever I save one of my MDK pages or artifacts. Back to the slides. If you want to learn more about this, we have an interesting help page that helps you to get more information about the mobile development kit. So in this unit, 
we have discussed the metadata and the concepts and how the metadata is being handled in the various editors and we also have discussed the project structure and the handling of projects. This concludes Unit 3, explaining the metadata of the Mobile Development Kit. Thanks a lot for listening. The upcoming unit is Building Rules for Mobile Development Kit Apps. I hope you to see you there. Welcome to Week 4, Unit 4. In the previous unit, I explained the metadata of the MDK. In this unit, I will show you how to build rules for mobile development kit apps. OK, let us start. So rules add custom behavior to your application. Rules can be used for many, many things in MDK. You can implement your local business logic. You can perform math if you need. You can validate values. Maybe if you want to check an input value. You can also manipulate the data, access device features like barcode, camera or whatever. And you can also add custom behavior to your UI. Maybe if you want to, you know, highlight a certain field and under certain circumstances. And there's almost no limit. Whenever you can program it, you can build it in. We have two rule editors in mobile mobile um, development kit. One is the Google Blockly based drag and drop what you see is what will be executed developer um, kind of editor which will generate the JavaScript for you. Here you don't need to know about the syntax but you need to know what a loop is, what an if else statement is and so forth. So you can basically drag and drop together uh, your JavaScript but you don't need to know the syntax. Anyhow, we have implemented various helpers into the Google Blackly editor here so that you can easily adjust it to the needs of the mobile development kit. The default for creating rules is the JavaScript though. Those two editors will not work bidirectional. That means if I create a rule graphically using the Blockly based editor, it will generate the JavaScript. But the other way around is not true. So if I build a JavaScript with a code editor, I will not get a visual representation in the Google Blockly editor. One important thing that we need to discuss is the so-called client API. The JavaScript that you provide has access to an object called client API. The client API provides a couple of methods for you that you can call to get certain information about the app. For instance, what current language is selected or what is the current page the user is currently viewing. You can also have date format or you can show the activity indicator, for instance. I think I already mentioned that the mobile development kit is built on the native script framework, an open source framework that we put our stuff on top of. Nevertheless, in the rules with in the JavaScript, you have access to the underlying native script APIs as well. So here, for instance, there are certain modules in native script that allows you to access, for instance, connectivity. So what about the uh, Wi-Fi connection or is it just 3G or 4G or whatever? You have access to the file system, to platform information and popping up dialogues is also possible. So here you see how you would use the client API to get to this native script modules and then use, for instance, the platform module to check on which platform you're running. Is it Android? And if yes, tell the user that he is an Android device. Maybe he know already. It's important to mention here that this code, if platform module dot is Android, has nothing to do with the cross-platform avail availability of the mobile development kit. So uh, that means we are doing the here not a typical thing to check whether we are an Android or iOS. This is not something that you need to do usually. Rules are just Java code snippets. That doesn't mean they will automatically be called. 
anywhere. What you need to do is you need to assign a rule, your JavaScript, to a certain event in your application to actually call them. So this is the general rule of thumb here. And an example for this is the application startup. The application startup is handled via the application.app metadata file. And here we have various events where you can build and put in your rule. So for instance, we will have an event in the application on will update. This, is a, this event will be called or executed when the server has a new revision of your metadata. Server means mobile services. And your client have already seen that there's a new version. In this particular example, we are asking the user with a pop-up, you want to update now, yes or no? If the user says yes, we execute the action, so this is a predefined action, to close the offline store and then we do the update. And if the user says no, we just ignore this update for the time being. As I said, this event or this JavaScript rule is bound to an event called on will update. We will later see that in the demo because that's exactly what we will debug and um, put breakpoints in it. Let's take a look at some more examples. Rules can also be bound to UI controls. So this is for instance to provide a specific value for this UI control. Here I just do some math and calculate the current quarter of the year and display it in a certain field of a page. The only thing I need to do here is to return the string quarter and the number of the quarter. When we create extensions to Mobile Development Kit, something that we won't do in this course, but if we do it, we want to see where our custom UI control appears on the screen. And these extensions are, can be referenced in the metadata. And here we see an example. Let's just assume for a second that we have written a J native script extension to our mobile development kit. This, on the one hand side, requires that we rebuild the mobile development kit client, which includes then the extension. But it will also make the custom UI module available in our metadata so that we can see it in the layout editor. Let's start the demo of how to debug in Visual Studio Code. I have prepared already a mobile development client locally on my developer machine. I also have connected my device to my local Mac in this case and I also included the metadata from our web ID into my Visual Studio project. On the right hand side you see the screen of my device and on the left hand side I have already started the debugger which I've done here in the debug view and pressed on the launch on iOS con launch configuration. This is the on will update JS JavaScript rule and I set a breakpoint right after the event when I close the alert by when I receive a new update. So in order to call the event, I just minimize the app and bring it back to the foreground. And this shows me that there's an update available, but I click cancel. And now I'm on the left-hand side stopped in the debugger. I also created a watch. So here you see the value of the result variable. It's false. This is the user answer. And I can now skip or step into the various JavaScript activities here. For instance, we have result false. So when I click on the next, I should then go into the steps and if I press play, I'm done. So you see that debugging in 
the Visual Studio Code extension is exactly as expected, locally deploying and developing as well as debugging applications is possible with the Mobile Development Kit. This concludes Unit 4, Building Rules for MDK Applications. The next unit will be about building your Mobile Development Kit client for a mobile device. Thanks a lot for listening. Welcome to week 4, unit 5. In the previous unit, I showed you how to build rules for MDK apps. In this unit, we will build an MDK client for a mobile device. Let's go. Building the client is very important during your development as well as for the rollout. The MDK client that we provide using the public app stores are not meant for being used in productive environments. They have been designed for demo purposes and learning, learning purposes as well. Actually, for distributing to your users, you need to build your own custom MDK client. This enables a lot of opportunities to you. You can provide your own app icon that you will see on the home screen. You will be able to, or actually you need to provide your own signing profiles for iOS, you distribute custom extensions if you want to extend beyond the capabilities of the existing MDK. You can adjust and provide end user license texts and add static assets to the application as well. One important feature as well is the so-called demo mode. So if you want to distribute your application and providing the option for the user to start locally a demo mode of your application without even actually connecting to any system, then this is the right way doing so. Customizing languages for, for the onboarding screens is also possible. And for using your own distribution channels, for instance, enterprise application uh, distribution stores, then you need your own client anyhow. You will build the MDK client using the Mobile Development Kit SDK. You can easily download the SDK to your developer machine and then you have full control over the build process. This is also mandatory if you want to debug mobile applications built on the MDK. The steps are very similar, simple. You download it and you need to install the prerequisites. The MDK comes with an application that helps you to check your local machine for the prerequisites. For instance, you need a Node.js installed and the native script environment. So this setup routine will make sure that you all have all these prerequisites in place and you're ready to go easily. Once you have done completely installed the SDK, you would create your local project. And for each project, and each MDK client, you would create your dedicated settings and a so-called folder. In that case, adjust the parameters that you want to need, uh, put into your client, and then you would build the client. There's another way of doing so with a lot less options. Anyhow, it's very convenient. With mobile services comes a cloud build service. This cloud build service allows you to create MDK applications, in this case clients, as you can see here on the right hand side, directly from within the cloud. There's no need to install any local artifacts on your local machine. Um, but on the other side, on the downside, so to say, you cannot adjust all of the features that are available in the Mobile Development Kit SDK. But here you can see, for instance, that you can provide the app name and also a logo, a, a logo and, and, and a device icon. And then you would initiate the build from within the web browser here. You will get the ability to download the IPA file afterwards and distribute to your testers, um, maybe even using the app lab. 
The App Lab is another feature of the mobile services and it helps you to distribute your apps to your test users. When the application, so the actual client, starts the very first time, the user needs to onboard it. In order to do so, and in order to tell the client to which instance of mobile services it should connect to, it needs some URLs and other security configurations to find the right instance. There are a couple of ways to provide these onboarding installation information. One is to provide it hard-coded and the other one is to create a schema, a link that the, where the app takes the information from. Initiating the onboarding process includes the startup parameters we just discussed and then the user will be taken to the authentication. After that has been done successfully, he can or cannot accept the EULA. Depending on the settings in mobile services, he may need to provide a passcode to the app. It may uh, be optional and also the policies may be, be applied to, to the passcode itself. So, for instance, a passcode could be like eight characters minimum, maybe just five. And then the client will get the first update from the server. This is the usual first start of the application. Afterwards, the second start, uh, this client already knows to which service instance it needs to connect. It also needs the user context and has all the OAuth tokens in place and can directly jump into the application. Again, there are two ways to provide this initial information. One is hard-coded and we will see that later on where we adjust the branded settings JSON. This is where all this information are stored. Or we create a schema URL and this is what we used in the web IDE. If you remember during the build process and deployment process there was an onboarding QR code and this is exactly the schema URL which then opens the application via a link and passes over all the onboarding information. This is how a typical branded settings.json file looks like. Here we have the application display name and the connection settings. As you can see, this app ID is exactly the app ID that you need to put into your mobile services app ID. It has nothing to do with the bundle identifier of the actual project. It's just a reference. The client ID here is the OAuth client ID and the cloud platform endpoint is where your mobile services instance is running and the other URLs here, the authorization, the redirect URL and token URL are used for the OAuth authentication. There are many other settings here but these are the important ones. Creating a schema URL that you want to distribute to your users to onboard it, maybe via email, maybe via a QR code. You would create a URL like this and specifically this first schema here, SAP Mobile Services, this would be individual for each client and you can uh, adjust that for each project. But the information is actually the same. You can also add the EULA text, the end user license agreement for each project. The text will be provided as a text file in the folder app resources slash platform, for instance, iOS. And you can also add other static assets into this, this directory. And these assets then are taken by platform considered by platform, meaning everything that is in iOS is just for the iOS platform. All the assets in Android are being compiled in the Android client. So in this demo, we will see what happened when you're using the MDK. We uh, look how a created client will look like and check the settings and see what needs to be built, how, how to build a client. 
in the hands-on, you will do that on your own machine. So here in the Visual Studio Code, I have opened the MDK client SDK folder and I quickly want to discuss with you what we have here. First of all, if you started the very first time, you should check the README SDK, but uh, other than that, in that directory you find the create client command, which will come in handy as well, and the same thing for uh, creating a client for Windows as well. Important folders here is the so-called uh, template.mdk project. This is where you would create an MDK project for each of your clients. You would copy that and create a your application name.mdk project out of this. So here let's check and compare it. The template create has um, for instance a folder for the metadata. Here it's empty but you would then add your metadata, your initial metadata to the application. The demo folder is for the offline demo that you want to give or provide probably or maybe to your users. App resources we also discussed. Here's the Euler texts for instance or other static images and here we do have the branded settings we talked about and the MDK project JSON. The branded settings I have opened here. The application display name, this is on the first screen, you will see that term. Here we see the app ID, the OAuth client and so forth. There are many other settings. Uh, what I want to point out here is that for instance the sign in button text that we have here is the label on the sign in button of the fir very first screen. Here it's let's get started. The MDK project would then just contain the version number, the bundle ID and the schema URL that you would need to call this client via this onboarding schema. Once I do have this I would issue the start and execute the create client command that will end up in a directory which is just the project name without the .mdk project. This is the actual project. Here you find for instance under platforms the iOS Xcode project. If this would be generated for Android as well you would have two folders within the platforms. One is iOS, one would be Android. One thing I want to show you as well. All these connection settings you can get from the mobile services client cockpit. So if you go back here and again log in into the mobile services cockpit, you can navigate to your application, Chef's Delight, and under APIs you will see the OAuth so the OAuth authorization link, the OAuth token and the server link. These you need to copy and put into the branded settings. What's missing is the redirect link for the OAuth authentication as well as the client ID which you will find on the security tab. This concludes Unit 5, building your MDK client for a mobile device. In the next unit, we will discuss styling mobile development kit apps. Thanks and hope to see you there. Welcome to week 4, Unit 6. In the previous unit, I showed you how to build your mobile development kit client for a mobile device. This unit is about styling mobile development kit apps. Ok, let's start. So the mobile development kit offers a couple of 
options to adjust the appearance of the application itself. The app icon. Obviously, you want to bring in your own app icon that will appear on the home screen. Also, custom color scheme can be applied to all the controls that you see in your application. We are using less, the leaner style sheets that can be applied to your user interface. This style sheet will then be applied to both platforms at the same time. So Android and iOS will get the, their information from the same source. The beauty of less is that you can define variables, as you see here on the left-hand side, and use them all over the places in all the various locations. So if you want to change a color consistently across your application, use a variable and then refer to it. Then you can just change the color once and it will be replaced everywhere. The styles have a special place in your in your uh, project. It's the styles folder. But putting a styles in that folder is not enough. You also need to design, uh, assign your styles to the application.app file and there's a special property which is called styles. So now let's talk a little bit about what you do in the styles uh, files. There are two ways of, of assigning a class, so a set of configuration and colors and, and behavior to a control, declaratively or programmatically. For example, you can write JavaScript code and this will apply a style on a certain user, user uh, control. A class is defined by dot name of the class and then you list the properties that you want to apply to that class. So here we have a button on the left hand side and we give it the class name some class and on the right hand side you see the same but doing this via a rule. On the top right you see the definition of the class color, background color, here we use the variable we talked before. So this is the class definition and you can statically put that into the metadata of that particular button to have the color assigned or you can use the rule. Here again you use the client API object to get the control you're currently assigning the rule to and then set the style. Styles can be also referenced by name. If you define a style by name, all the UI controls with the matching dot name property will apply it, uh, will, will get the style automatically. So here we have a name, a, a UI control with the name lockout toolbar item. And to apply the style by name, we define a style name lockout toolbar item with a hash in front of it. You can also style by type. So all types of a UI control, of a given UI control, have the same style. So for instance, all the action bars will have the color white and the background color red. This can also be done for the MDK page itself or the toolbar. The app icon can be provided by either the cloud build service or using the cloud build service here, when you download the, and upload the file to the server, it will be used during the build process. But you can also build your own client, as we've seen before, and apply your own app icon there. In the demo, we will just fix the styles of our Chef's Delight application. So here again, I'm using Visual Studio, Studio Code to change the styles. On the right hand side, you see my device. I don't want to update now. First, I apply or I provide a style.less file. I have prepared that already. 
And the nice thing about Visual Studio Code is here that if I'm using a less file or even a cascading style sheet file, it shows me the colors in a preview mode. This is actually just a pure text file. So here we have defined the action bar with the color white and the background color is red. Maybe not the nicest one, but it should do the trick for the moment. In order to apply the styles, these styles to the user, uh, user interface, we need to reference the application in, uh, reference this style in the application.app file. So here we still see the styles. And instead of using the style sheets, which I want to show you that as well, is currently empty. So all that you see here on the right hand side is the default style. So in order to change that, I just need to press um, control space and then it also shows me what styles are available in the styles folder. Here I choose the styles.less file and save it. While saving the application or any metadata file in Visual Studio Code, it will trigger a rebuild. So we will build in the background this bundle.js file. If you have a connected device, it will automatically restart the application and applies the style. So in this week, we have seen and discussed the mobile development kit in general. We have created a mobile development kit application. We have discussed the metadata, building rules for applying custom behavior. And we have built a custom client and we can now apply our own styles to it. This concludes the final unit of week four, cross-platform native app development. In the next and final course week, we will discuss native app development. And I will also wrap up the course. In case of questions or feedback, please visit the discussion forum. I wish you all good luck for the weekly assignment and hope to meet you again in course week five. Bye-bye.